Is everybody ready? I'm ready. Cool. Hell yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very on-brand heckling. I like that. Um, hi, I'm Bob. This is my wife, Alex. Hello. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm really excited for uh, quite a few reasons. Uh, the first is that this really feels like my community. Uh, I've worked with the Ready, I've worked with August, I've worked with Chanel. Matias, who you just saw speak, is a friend of mine who I introduced here, and I know a lot of faces in the audience here, and I just, I just really love this group of people. I think we're small, but we're significant, right? This group is amazing. Um, and the, the second reason I'm really excited to be here today is that I get to do something on stage with my wife. I've never spoken on stage with her before never written a book before, with her before until we did this. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Alex, she's incredible. She is the co-creator of the Oscar-nominated documentary, Super Size Me. And in my opinion, she's really the heart and soul of that movie. She's the reason. She was you know, on screen. She was kind of behind the scenes. She was like the vegan girlfriend in the background, if you saw the movie. Um, I kind of fell in love with her watching the movie, before, and that was like, Actually, this is the other thing. I didn't tell you this. I did not tell you this. <laughs> so I got, a, I got an email this morning from a friend of mine named Justin. And Justin told me that it was seven years ago today at a dinner party at his house where I met you. Seven years ago what? today. What? Yeah. It's our meet anniversary. It's our meet anniversary. Yeah. Now, now, now. She did ignore my Facebook message for three weeks. Okay, Before. we're going off topic here, so I'm just gonna go there. Who here checks their Facebook messages religiously uh, for a date offer? Hello? <laughs> Not anymore. As soon uh, as I saw it, I responded. Yes. I was like, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> now I'm blushing. So, uh, yeah, so we get to create things together. And, and I mean, honestly, like Alex, if you don't know her yet, get to know her. She's incredible. And really, when I think about Super Size Me, I think about she was the heart and soul of that movie. It's the reason that movie had such meaning and such powerful impact. And that's really what she's all about. She's all about impact. She's all about making a difference. And she does it in this incredibly sort of kind of behind the scenes, a little subtle way, I think. I don't know. She has this, this quality about her. Uh, and I'm gonna let her talk about the next reason that we are excited to be here, which is really kind of the why of this book. Well, if you're gonna talk about how much you like me, I'm Don't gonna talk about blush. how much I like you real quick. <laughs> so when I met Bob and over the last seven years, honestly, it took me a few years to understand what a consultant was. <laughs> and in the last few years, especially as we were in the process of understanding and creating what we're about to tell you about, I finally came to see that this guy loves people so much. And I had this erroneous idea that corporations were these big, huge, faceless monoliths. He helped me see that corporations and companies are filled with people who want to do good things in the world. And he goes into these companies and with so much love for the people that he's working with. And I have by proxy fallen in love with all of you and the communities that he has worked with over time. And this, what we're gonna share with you, has, is a direct result of the work that we've both been in separately for the last 20 plus years. And another thing that I love about him is our we have a shared value of love of learning. A few years ago, um, we discovered that my son had a, a, a serious dyslexia diagnosis, and I didn't know how to help him think positively and develop resilience and grit. We stumbled into a positive psychology training, and he was as much a hell yes about diving into this world of positive psychology as I was, which is one of the things I love about him. And in positive psych, we learned that really Marty Seligman, the grandfather of positive psych, says you can boil down what it is in three words, other people matter that it's our relationships, it's the people that we interact with that gives us juice, that makes it worth getting up in the morning, that you know keeps us going when times are hard and inspires us to do greater and greater things. And, and that's kind of what this book is about. 
Yeah, it impacts your mood, impacts your productivity, it impacts even the outcomes that you experience in life. I don't know if you know this, but if your friend's friend gets divorced, your likelihood of getting divorced, assuming you're married, goes up by about 20, 25%, something like that. So there's uh, at Yale's Human Na Nature Lab, a guy named Nicholas Christakis has been mapping these kinds of things for a long time. And it's not just true of divorce, it's true of any kind of outcome you might experience, getting wealthy, getting skinny, getting fat, all of these things follow along social networks. So the who we interact interact with and the how we interact with them are wildly important. And those of you, I mean, we're here at a conference, which is, I think is essentially about better organizations and better teamwork. And here we really, we really know that you know, our day-to-day -day interactions really matter. And so it took us a long time to figure out that this, we've been using this methodology, by the way, basically since we met. We developed it and used it in a couples workshop or a communication workshop we were teaching. And it just sort of like sat on the shelf for a long time, but it sort of worked its way into our life. And then people kept calling us and saying, hey, you know, t describe it to us. So we said, let's write a Google Doc just so we don't, can stop explaining it, like get people off, you know. And they're like, we started writing it. We're like, oh, hey, this should be something. What should we call it? And we like, we're like, hell yes, let's call it something. So the, that's sort of the, the interpersonal, like, like kind of selfish, like we all know that good interactions feel good and bad interactions feel bad. And this is really about helping us have better interactions. Um, we also get asked, I am a consultant, so I get asked a lot about ROI. Um, I always think that's a little bit of a hedge. If someone is asking me about ROI, I really think they're asking me about something else. They don't quite trust me yet. But let's just review very quickly. I think all of you, um, this, this will be kind of a, a very quick review. Most of you probably know this. But we know that the performance of a team is really impacted by the degree of psychological safety. There's a lot of other things in there. And psychological safety itself is sort of a catch-all for a lot of things. Um, but one of the key indicators um, from Amy Edmondson's work, if you know her work, that you have psychological safety is that I feel she calls it average social sensitivity. That if I'm looking at a team member and I can sort of intuit how they're feeling today and be somewhat accurate about it, that indicates that I have some awareness and some sensitivity to that person. I'm probably in a more psychologically safe environment. There are other things that contribute to that, but that's one of the things is having a little bit of connection with each other is really important. So psychological safety itself is sort of a function of trust. And there's been a lot of work done on trust, obviously, and also just general awareness. like. Don't be a jerk. Like, like, be aware of the people around you and your impact on them. And that really brings us to kind of the why of this book, which is when you deliberately take time to speak about your personal context and listen to the personal context of the people that you're working with, their motivations, their concerns, their desire, it's a super efficient way to begin building sort of this foundation of psychological safety. And it's something we don't often do because there's all of these things that impact how we show up at work that are either taboo to talk about or there's just not the space to talk about it. Or sometimes someone comes in and says, be vulnerable. You should be more vulnerable. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, like, so there's not even like a context. So what we wanted to do was create a sort of a safe space to have that conversation. And that really brings us to the next bit. And if I may interject about this last engaged team, if you read the introduction, this is written by one of my dearest friends. I taught her this, what I'm about, we're, we're about to teach you. She took it home taught it to her husband, called me about a week and a half later and said, I think this just saved my marriage. She also has five children and she uses it. Talk about an engaged team. It's a family of seven and they really had to work on their teamwork. So it has been a foundational tool of our relationship with our son and the other people that we're teaching it to in business contexts immediately are taking it home. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, it's really about being more human, more empathic in your business life, but also it can be used to be actually a little more strategic in your personal life. And I don't know about you, but I've sometimes made bad decisions in my personal life. And it's been based on passion often, you know, and, and, I, and a friend of mine, he likes to say um, that love is a terrible reason to get married, you know, like it's that really you want to get married to somebody who has similar life goals to you, who has, who's kind of on the same path. And I'm living proof that this is true. It is really a bad idea to get married to somebody who you feel merely passionate about, but look for someone you feel passionate as well as aligned with. <laughs> so, so this has become a ritualized conversation 
in the teams and in the families that we've shared it with. It certainly is in our relationship. And this ritualized, again, it's a very, very simple construct that we're gonna show you. It does create this feeling of safety. You have a structure and it's really simple. Our 11 year old now like basically knows what it is because we've brought it up so many times with them. And doesn't roll his eyes. And does not roll his eyes yet. He's only 11. He's only 11. <laughs> seventh grade people, seventh grade. And it really helps everyone be a little thorough. Again, when we talk about being vulnerable, what the heck does that mean? This simple structure helps you have that safe feeling so that you can be vulnerable because everyone's doing the same step at the same time. Yeah. Great. So if you're going to have this conversation, I'm, I'm assuming I'm in a room full of facilitators, both, you know, people who either want to be facilitators or have a lot of experience facilitating. So a lot of this is going to be the basics. Um, but what my experience is, is that when we forget the basics, uh, that, we, that we, we kind of end up in the wrong spot. We end, up, we, we end up kind of, and when I cut corners, I inevitably regret it. And so I'm gonna be a little pedantic here. Um, first, when we're setting the stage, we wanna make sure we have enough time for the conversation. This particular conversation, we find 10 to 20 minutes per person in the group is probably best because everybody needs to speak. Every time you add a person, you add a little more, you know, another, another 10 or 20 minutes to the conversation. I've run this for as many as seven to I think actually 14 people once, which was a little, it took a long time. It was very rich. Um, but uh, usually somewhere between two and seven is probably your sweet spot, just like a, just like a, a functional team. Likewise, you want to be in a good space. A nice outside window is helpful. Um, not a fishbowl conference room where people are walking past and there's going to be a lot of distraction. We often like to even just get out of the house. Um, we've done it and, you know, walked through the park and done it, have a, had a walking meeting. Um, likewise, uh, when we do it personally, we also like to do it over dinner, but also maybe keep the alcohol to a minimum, if not a complete, you know, no alcohol, no wine with this particular dinner is good. The last bit is you want to make sure that we agree on what the topic is. And now we find the topic is a really powerful forcing function to really get you in the right space. You want to know what you're going to be discussing, but more importantly, you want to know why you're discussing it. And that why needs to be phrased in a way that is um, collaborative, right? So let's say we're talking in our personal life about going on vacation. We're talking about going on vacation so we both have an excellent vacation uh, and we both have a good time on it. Or we're talking about the, this new pro uh, product launch team, like we're, we're launching a new product or a new product team. We want to be a successful, high-functioning team. So it's, a, it's just sort of like it begins to get that, remember, this is about a hell yes, this is about alignment. So we want to start off with the intention that it is an alignment, that alignment is the intent of the conversation. And here's a way to not introduce this to oh, yeah. someone that you're, you're maybe versed in it, you want to take this home to someone or introduce it to your team. Maybe this is just a good life rule. Never start a conversation with, we need to talk. Nothing good has ever come after that sentence. So perhaps phrase it in a more friendly way. I even recommend to my one-on-one -on -one clients, just write these four things down on a post-it note, hand it to the person, say, hey, tomorrow night after dinner or tomorrow before the all hands meeting, let's cover these four things and give them a chance to just have a little a heads up about it. And a plug for the product, the cheat sheet you have is free on our website and it was also designed right. for this purpose too. The perfect thing you can hand to someone before going through this. Cool. Uh, did you want me to do this too? Yeah, you go ahead. that's right. Yeah, yeah cool. So um, you're also going to have roles in the conversation. Both of you are going to speak, or all of you are going to speak. All of you are going to listen. Um, the listener's job is really to be open, be curious, not to feel like they are taking orders from the other person. Likewise, the speaker's job is to be vulnerable and to be thorough. We actually just saw an amazing, amazing person speak last night named Priya Parker. I don't know, how, how many people have read the book, The Art of Gathering? Have you guys seen this? It's one of my favorite books out right now, and we, we had the pleasure of meeting the author last night. One of the things she said is that if you're going to have a meeting or a gathering that's gonna change something, which is gonna be transformative, there has to be some heat. There has to be some conflict. She's a conflict resolution specialist who is a fan of conflict, right? So we want people to, and so vulnerability is not just being vulnerable in that sense of I'm going to like share with you like, you know, maybe irrelevant details from my, you know, like that I, I've heard it described as the orgy of self-disclosure, but I, I am going to share with you sort of what is true for me that I think you might even have a hard time hearing. And so we really want to re emphasize that this is an opportunity to share the things that we often don't talk about in a way that hopefully is safe. And by saying like, look, you're not ordering off a menu 
and you're not hearing orders off a menu. We're really just trying to discover some alignment here, whether we're aligned or not, um, and we're going to listen. Likewise, we think a facilitator is really valuable. Um, if you have three people in the conversation, one of those can be the facilitator, three or more. Uh, if you have a particularly intense conversation, I play this role a lot. Uh, I come in as a non-participant facilitator of the conversation. I think that's really valuable. I do that all the time. And just one of my personal favorite quotes around being a good listener is from Alan Alda. I don't know if you listen to his podcast on how scientists can better explain their theories to the public, but he talks about how you're not really listening if you're not willing to be changed by the other person. So there is this open curiosity that a listener can bring to any conversation. And allow the heat to build. Allow, allow, little, allow for a little heat. It's OK. Um, and finally, take turns. No crosstalk. Don't, you know, no commenting off on the side on what other people are doing. You know, have your phones away. Be present. You know, basic meeting hygiene. Be an adult. <laughs> be nice to each other. Right. Yeah. And we always also say, like, there's an opportunity to ask questions in, in, in this process, and the question should be curious and based on actually wanting to get more information, not a commentary disguised as a question. Right. Cool. Was this me or you? I forget. Now. Yeah. Both of us. All right. We all know this. Be vulnerable. Be curious. Yeah. I don't know what else we need to say about that. Yeah. Don't be a dick. That's a good one. All right, cool. <laughs> we'll put that on for next time. <laughs> cool. All so right. um, it's a four-part conversation, and now we get to have the conversation. Now we get to go through the four parts. We're each going to take turns. Again, actually, another thing, uh, another indicator that you have psychological safety on a team is when everybody is speaking in a roughly the same amount. Roughly the same amount of words are coming out of everybody's mouth and, and in, in, on the team, and not one person is dominating or one person isn't shrinking way back. Uh, and so I always think of this as an opportunity to, again, like sort of reverse engineer that a little bit. Like, let's at least model. Maybe we don't have that currently on our team, but for today, we can model it. Um, actually, another thing that Priya said last night, which I really loved was, and, and maybe this is good, I'm going to maybe add this to the instructions. She's like, judge me later, don't judge me now. So in other words, like, you're going to judge me, but wait until we're done with the process. Wait until we're done with the experience. Wait until the gathering is over because I've designed it to lead us into a very specific space. So anyway, I think that's good advice. So intentions. Uh, intentions is really, we could call this purpose as well. We could call this your why. I'm always there because I think I'm going to make some money. Um, I'd like to make money. I also love to have fun. And as Alex mentioned, um, we have a shared value of love of learning. Like we both really enjoy learning new things and trying new things. And there may be, you know, for different experiences, there may be different things. Now, I will also say this, that um, this isn't the only way to get to an intention. I did, ran this recently with an executive team uh, at, a non, at a, <laughs> an organization that I will not name. Uh, that was having some trouble. They were having some difficulty. And the founder is someone who I deeply respect, and I've known, I've known his work for many, many years. And yet, they were having a very difficult time with the culture of this team. And it was, it was, a, really, it was a really rough spot. Like, I really believe in the mission of this organization, and the team was having a really hard time, and really needed to level set, really needed to come together. And so when it got to be his turn, like, why are you creating this organization? Why do you want this organization to be successful? He actually had to tell us a long, relatively long story. He had to go back to his childhood and talk about some rather severe trauma, actually, that he experienced repeatedly as a child and how that had led him to exactly the topic we were under discussion, exactly what the, the mission of this organization was about. And <laughs> I'm getting a little, like, emotional. Like, there was not a dry eye in the room. Like, we were all so, you know, like, and all of the things that we made, the trouble, the difficulty we might have had with him, it's not that it all went away, but we understood it a little bit more. We forgave it a little bit more, and we felt a little bit more pulled together. It was, uh, yeah, anyway. We have some questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I lost track. This is I why so I love excited. you. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have prompt questions. By the way, these slides are also available. This is also, you know, also kind of a free resource we provide. But is um, why do you want to be a part of this project, this team, this thing that we're doing? We really struggle with what this word should be in a generic sense because you can swap it out for so many different things. Um, actually, Alex and I, we used it when we decided. We, we've both been married before. We were, we're a little bit older when we decided to get married. Um, so marriage was not the, quite the thing we were thinking about. We were using this conversation about our relationship. We were saying, so it was really, why do you want to be a part of this relationship was kind of the, the prompt question. And by the end of the conversation, we decided to get married and throw a great party. So I was, was really not going to get married again. Yeah, and this process made me want to get married again. Yeah. Yeah. 
by the end of the conversation, she was like, well, maybe if you did propose, I might say yes. <laughs> so um, I wanted to propose, pr propose to her like the, the day I met her. But anyway, that's, that's a other story. So um, how can this project support your personal goals? So again, it's really intensely, it's intensely personal. And what values of yours led you to get involved in this project? So again, we're just trying to get at your why. These you don't have to answer all these questions. These are just here to get you thinking. Um, because there's a lot of different sort of angles we can approach um, this particular question is. And hopefully one of those will be resonant for you. Which brings us to our next bit. So then after each person shares their intentions, you go into concerns. And I actually have come to really love this part. I used to see almost every big conversation as a confrontation. I thought somebody had to win and somebody had to lose. And I hate being really mean and I hate losing. So I would just avoid conversation, high stakes, highly emotional conversations. But after practicing this, sharing what the fears are, sharing what the worries are, it really helps the little amygdala, that lizard brain, put all of the, the even the crazy worries. Like, we talked about this process when deciding to write this book. We went through the process ourselves. And one of my worries was, maybe we hate working together and this really impacts our relationship negatively. So just putting it out there is actually a wonderful psychological tool called self-talk, where you let the amygdala speak. You put out all the worries and concerns. And because it's received in a safer environment, that lizard brain can just calm down. And even in the moment when you express them, you'll see the other people witnessing you. And you're like, oh, maybe this isn't really a worry. This is just part of me that's worried about survival. Yeah, and I will say getting it out, like actually speaking it. Um, so our, our friend Srini Pillay, who's a neuroscientist up at Harvard, one of the things that he, he talks about self-talk, that if self-thinking self is not nearly as powerful as self-talk, there's something about actually making it audible and hearing it, and I would say adding the component of having some compassionate listening around you can really make all the difference in the world. And actually, Alex made me do self-talk this morning while I was worried about this presentation today. So. <laughs> So wait, one of the other pieces of concerns, this is, I think, one of the really brilliant aspects of it. Sometimes Bob describes this process as um, an emotional prenup, where you still are really in good rapport together before you start something or endeavor to pursue a, a new line. Um, and you're looking for the landmines ahead of you. You're kind of pre-gaming what are the big challenges that might come. And while you're still liking each other, and you see that these might be problems, you're in a good positive space where you can figure out how to deal with it in the future. Yeah. And uh, that's actually, but okay, so first, these are some concern questions. What worries you about the team? What do you think is gonna get in our way? Where are, where are we gonna run into trouble, essentially? Um, and kind of, you know, honestly, humans don't need to be prompted too much to worry. You know, like we, are, we have a very strong, Evolutionarily, I mean, this is, it's a very great adaption. We have a very strong negativity bias. We notice and we plan for negative things in our environment all the time. Um, so this is just really an opportunity to let that kind of crazy brain out and let it speak. And often when you do speak it, right, it, it loses all teeth. Yeah. It's sort of like... It dissipates on its own. Yeah. Or you come up with, like, I mean, when we were talking about the book, like, I'm worried we might get divorced. Okay, well, then we'll throw the book away. You know, like, if this <laughs> leads to trouble, then that's our... And that really leads us to the next bit, which is boundaries. And boundaries, you can think of them as guardrails. You can think of them as bright lines. These are the things across which we won't go and across which other people aren't welcome. Um, they're best when they're a little bit flexible and negotiable, but we also want them to be binary and clear. We want to know what they are and sort of know where we're starting, not to be vague about them. When I work in a business environment, um, I really have to emphasize that, look, it's around self-care. Uh, and so it's, it's really weird to me. And I, I've heard the word engagement. I don't know. How, I mean, I think we should have like a, a, like we should, no, we shouldn't drink every time we hear the word engagement. That would be a terrible idea. <laughs> at this conference, that would be a horrible idea. Um, but, uh, but you know, we hear engagement all the time, and yet there's this idea that, that work comes first, and that you should be a team player, and that you should be dedicated to the project, and you should put all of your, everything else aside. Is this sounding familiar at all, like, in order, to, in order to do this project? And it's almost unspoken in most organizations that I operate inside of, that the, that the work comes first, the organization comes first. 
but answer me this, if, you, if we want people to be their best and perform their best, but we don't allow them to take care of themselves in the way that they know, because we don't know how they need to take care of themselves, and everybody is unique and everybody is different, how do we expect them to show up and be engaged? And so I really try, again, to be speaking about heat, speaking about conflict, speaking about like sort of getting some taboos out there on the, uh, you know, in, the, in the air, like tell me what you need to be successful. And also tell me where your other commitments are because often people are on a project inside an organization and this is one of five projects they're on. So where is this in the project pecking order? It may be one for some person and maybe five for somebody else and we should probably know that ahead of time and, and honor that ahead of time. I actually had a huge breakthrough around this. I'm, as Bob will tell you, I'm great with boundaries in my personal life. I was raised by a high school principal. So I learned about boundaries from day one. In my professional life as a coach and mentor, I realized I had some terrible boundaries, letting people email me and text me and you know, making appointments with clients after dark during the week. And I realized through the practice of this that I had to show up as a coach and mentor for women who are trying to rise in their own careers, my boundaries are a way to teach her to have better boundaries in her life and got very, very crystal clear about the boundaries in my own work. Going as far as to have my virtual assistant shield me from any negative emails that ever come in about my podcast or my books or anything. I'm certainly in connection with my clients, but I don't even see the negative feedback. If there's haters out there, I don't know it because it's totally shielded by my boundary. It's fabulous, I highly recommend it. I love that so much. Um, yeah, so boundaries, what do you need to be at your personal best? What will keep us from overreaching or burning out? I think this is really common, especially in project teams and in businesses. And what rules or standards will help keep this make this team its best and keep this team at its best? And, and for here, it can be some shared boundaries, right? Or some shared working agreements, like let's make weekends weekends. You know, like let's not email each other on the weekends. Or, uh, you know, I always say, look, if um, our uh, Alex's son is with us half time when he's with us, I go home for dinner and I don't pick up email at the, the rest of the day. But if you want me to work late, and if I want to work on, late on a project, then when he's not with us is the time to make that happen. And so just kind of letting my teammates know. And again, I think I, think I have the same experience as you. Like the stronger my boundaries are, the happier I get. You know, like it's, it, you know, sometimes, and sometimes I get, you know, you get a, like a false positive. Sometimes you probably cut out somebody or something that you shouldn't with a boundary. But I think it's way, that's way lower cost than letting in something that you shouldn't let in. So. I may be digressing a little bit. So great, so you've gotten through the hard pit and now you have to get to have some fun. Now I wanna go back to one thing about boundaries. If you have never been really explicit about your personal boundaries before, consider them starter boundaries, right? Make it known that, hey, we're, you know, we're starting this, your boundaries might change, they might get clearer. In our relationship, we now have a shorthand where, hey, I have a new boundary, just discovered it, let's talk about it. Or you know that boundary doesn't apply anymore. Things can change. That's where the flexibility in this system really comes to life. And I will say, again, intentions, concerns, and boundaries, all three of these things are things that we're not, we generally don't talk about. They're things that we might, some of us might be better about being more explicit about them with ourselves, but we generally don't share them with other people unless they're people, unless you're you know, from California and, and, or something, you know, but hey. <laughs> you're from Oregon, it's all right. Um, but anyway, and also I, I actually, this, is, this one applies as well, because this is something that we don't allow ourselves to do a lot because it feel, doesn't feel safe, which is? This is my favorite. Let's end on a high note and really talk about our dreams, our biggest desires for whatever it is that we're talking about. You can really re-inspire yourself. You can really connect with the soul of the other people on this project, really, Go big, let your imagination take off and be a little selfish, put it on you first. You know what I really want for me out of this? I hope that this happens for me and I hope that that happens for you. I want that for you and this for me and this for all the people that we're gonna connect with. You know, really go for it. And we've found that this, I mean, talk about building oxytocin. When you start like talking your dreams into existence, you bring all of your energies to it you end up getting motivated to help with any of the friction or challenges that you uncovered in the process. Or, and this is actually a beneficial outcome, right? This is like where you find your hell yes. This is where you're like, yes, we're doing this. Okay, we have a couple areas to work on, but we know where we're going. And after this, you might actually find that you're a hell no. 
Oh, these are just some questions. Again, they're prompt questions. If this goes incredibly well, what'll be true? How will you feel? Where will you be? You know, like get visceral about it. Get a, get a strong vision going. Um, I will be on stage at the Responsive Conference launching our book. <laughs> and people will cheer afterwards. Um, and what metrics will have shifted? So again, like in a business context, this is a great place to begin saying like, okay, so what, what's, gonna be, what's gonna be different? This, this is a, it's actually a sort of a revisit of the intention, but it's a revisit of the intention with, with, with the intent to make it really good. It's not just the initial like what gets you through the door, but it's actually what would be an incredibly, incredible outcome. And I think neurophysiologically, this is just sort of a great place to spend time. We like to spend like, like as much time on this as we spend on all other three combined, you know, like in, in terms of timing for the conversation, because this one's just so, so damn fun. And, uh, and the, for this one, you can have drinks, by the way. You can continue on and have some drinks. It's good. Uh, and to Alex's point, um, you may discover that you're a hell yes. We're hoping that that's what you discover. The intent is to discover deep alignment. Um, and you may discover that you don't have it, that, that, that there's something fundamentally flawed, but I can guarantee you it's much better to do it now, like before you get started, before you've invested ego, time, money, energy into the project, uh, and, you're, and you're ready to, you know, you're, 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 you're ready to go. Is that, is that time? Flood warning? Flood warning. Okay. Yeah, right on. Keep huh? an eye out for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My intention is to stay dry. Okay. Um, cool. Is, are we good? We're good. We're All ready right. to roll. So with that, we want to bring up uh, a couple of brave souls. Um, maybe give them Our a little bit of applause. Our gonna, Jeremy and Sherry. Yeah, grab the chairs over there. Yeah, those are for you. And we'll share a microphone, and you can share a microphone. So, uh, okay, good. Jeremy and Sherry have uh, been kind enough. To, uh, to demo the conversation with us. This is sort of that moment in the cooking show where you've already got the thing baked and you pull it out, right? So we have worked with them in advance. This isn't completely, completely, uh, completely raw. But uh, we would love to start off with, first off, can you guys tell us, remember we talked about topic, you know, the sort of the what you want to talk about and the why you want to talk about it and why you're going to be talking about it. So just go ahead and share that with us. Uh, well, Jeremy and I first connected about a month ago, um, so we actually just met in person at the Responsive Conference. Uh, actually, he's the one that told me about the Responsive Conference. Uh, but we connected because a mutual acquaintance of ours um, realized that we're both using art in a way to uh, inspire others um, towards some sort of greater social impact or goal. And uh, so he and I set up a time to chat and uh, realized that there was a lot of overlap and alignment um, in terms of uh, our work. And so we thought that it might be cool at some point to partner up and see if there was a way for us to, um, to collaborate. And uh, that, was, that was the extent, I think, of the conversation. And then uh, the stars sort of aligned so that we were able to actually meet in person here at the Responsive Conference. And this has been an opportunity for us to think about, okay, what are the next steps? How can we actually make something materialize? And if I could just ask you both to hold the mic a little bit closer to your mouths, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Um, what am I adding on to that? If, if you have anything, oh. please add it on. So what we're, we're just, hearing is that, it's a, I'm sorry, that there's a potential partnership that you're thinking about. And so that's, and, and the why we want to talk about a potential partnership is, so great. we determine whether it, we want to go forward with it or not, or so it goes well. Am I paraphrasing okay? Or? Yeah, that's great. Right. Um, well, I just want to say that I love how it happened because I didn't know you were coming until two days before the conference. Neither did I. And we were, we were actually supposed to meet in October and we were like, oh, you, um, you're going to be in San Francisco in October. And so this is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. you, you summarized it. Everything else. Great. Great. And so either of you can go for this. So we're going to go for the first question then. So your intention. So what, assuming that you are going to partner. You know that, that that a partnership is happening. What would be your intention? Why would you want to partner? What would be your purpose in partnering? Why, what makes you stronger together, or better together than than separate? I mean, one thing I mentioned to you when we first talked, I I feel like you have a lens into the data and research and the way that you back up your work that just seems really valuable. And I'm just like, wow, I love the way that you present your work. And um, my my intention is that the art stuff that I'm doing and the creative interactive stuff can, can work together with your stuff in a way that 
that brings it more to the forefront, that gives it a different flavor that people are attracted to, and, and vice versa, that um, I think the heart of what I do is around creating belonging through art and storytelling. And so to be able to partner with more organizations and you, Faldi, it's like, yeah, that feels great. And I would love to be able to be partnering in some way to be stronger together. Uh, so similarly, um, you know, I, I, so everything you just said around what you're doing, um, my intention for all, you know, for all intents and purposes is to reach as many people as possible in a really deep and meaningful way. And from the way that you described your work, it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're helping p people create something that they feel a sense of ownership over and feel inspired by on a day-to-day -day basis. Every time they walk by it, they feel that sense of, um, belonging and inspiration. So uh, for me, that was a sort of missing element that I thought would complement our work really beautifully. And uh, my intention was to, to see if there was a way for us to be able to amplify our, our you know, individual work together. Cool, thank you. So um, let's move into concerns. What worries, what, you know, what do you think might get in the way is, are there any areas of challenge that you're already anticipating when you think about working together? What's gone wrong in previous partnerships, perhaps? Or, you know, like when you think about the, uh, the partnerships and you're kind of casting your mind ahead, what are the things that... I didn't come into it with any um, immediate, you know, immediate worries. I guess the first, if I had to think about it, would be the fact that I am East Coast based and you are West Coast based, <laughs> which makes it somewhat difficult to actually be in the same place, especially if what you're working on is physical art. Um, so that was one thing. Um, I don't know how far along you are in terms of the, um, like the progress of Be Socially Creative. Um, we're fairly new. We've only been around for two years and we're still figuring out a lot of things, which I think is both an opportunity and a concern. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, beyond that, you know, the opportunity, the actual opportunity to do this for a partner organization hasn't come up yet, so we'd have to find that, which is another concern. Great, thank you. Do I speak to the concerns or do I voice my concerns? Just voice your own concerns. That's such a perfect question. Like, we're not figuring it all out right now, just hearing them. I think. I was trying to find concerns and I couldn't really find them right now and, and, there, and there's one I'll name that I can stretch just to, in the spirit of it. Um, and, but the fact that, so I'm about a year new and I'm shifting and there's so much that keeps on gr growing and moving and so for me in part I'm like, I'm like okay I have a product and I know how I'm integrating and I'm seeing the feedback so there's enough clarity and like there's some clarity and I'm like I don't, there's like how are we really um, Basically, I have a lot of questions about your work, too, and I want to learn more about it. Yeah. And so, and then it's less of a, it, it's part of a concern. There's, in the diversity and inclusion realm, I've seen so much, there's a lot of research on um, people having a lot of poor prior experiences in diversity and inclusion. And so people show up to the space, to spaces that are supposed to build understanding and, and bring people closer, and they're actually, they, they show up with, with with guards up and I'm wondering how, it's more of a question of like, I'm wondering how the, the, um, the words and the languaging and the things that gen equality is bringing up, how that takes on ownership in a, in a community yeah. in a way that's really impactful. Yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and that brings us to boundaries. And obviously we could have a richer conversation. Sometimes there can be some back and forth here. Again, curious questions are great. Um, and I really appreciated the way you dug deeply, I think, and it actually, I actually felt a lot in what you said. Like I felt like, okay, those are things that actually are really valid and really helpful for a potential partner to know. Um, so this brings us to boundaries. And boundaries here, we can actually think about in a couple different ways. One is, you personally, what do you need to be at your personal best? The other is, you mentioned East Coast, West Coast. You know, so like in your experience working with East Coast, West Coast, what's maybe a working agreement that you might suggest? We don't have to like decide on it now, but we might throw it out there and see. 
Uh, we might talk about money. We might talk about, you know, like we're going to share things 50-50 or not. Like, again, sort of the design criteria that any legal documents might lead to down the, you know, might lead to legal documents down the road, those kinds of things. And again, I, I also want to emphasize, too, too that, um, and I'll borrow this from um, the integrative decision-making um, process, that the word unspecified is really a fine thing to say. Like, I have some concerns about money, we probably need to figure it out, but I'm unspecified right now on exactly what that is. We're gonna have to have the conversation further down. So I'm gonna let you let you roll a little bit. Boundaries. I, mean, I think it's really funny that both of us were like, we don't have work boundaries right now. <laughs> and um, start it off. Yeah. I'm not a morning person, so it, it's actually great that you're on the West Coast because by the time I am fully functional, that's about when you're waking up. So uh, this actually works really well. <laughs> Anything else? I mean, like at this point, I feel like in terms of like money stuff and all of that, I feel like we're not even to that point to even figure out. Cool. Great. And. Finally, dreams. If this was to go really, really well and be an amazing partnership, what would be true? What would happen for each of you? What would happen for you guys together? Like, and doesn't, you know, there can be many different forms. Like, we would form a giant international nonprofit, and one person may not be interested in that. That's okay. But just sort of like, what's the thing that, that, that would make this feel like it was wildly successful for you? All right. Uh, for me, I, I mean, the dream would be to walk into every workplace in America, every you know cafe gathering place, and see our art, our collaborations that are driven by and built by the people within that community. Um, to see that sort of purposeful art in there, in a way that isn't just about so. Not that there's anything wrong in any way with just having art, but the art in and of itself is also inspiring. Um, inclusion and um, and belonging, and you know it's driven by our sort of research and our our sort of action, our calls to action at Gen Equality, but also developed in a way that's you know informed by your approach. Um, I, I mean, for me, the dream is to see it to see it everywhere, to see you know to walk into to spaces and see it and be out there in the world. I lo I love all that. And, and I'm just like, like, this is my favorite space to be. It's like, it's like, wow, what's the dream of this whole thing? And um, just to build off it, just like seeing people creating art together that is meaningful for them. And they're just like the colors and the engagement with it and then the words and then the, the curiosity. And, you know, you said ownership. And, and um, I think bringing and bringing and like just seeing, yeah, I just see it like swirling around in all kinds of, and in all kinds of uh, workplaces, and you said cafes, and I mean, I feel like I could just like just reiterate a lot of things you said about the stuff happening more. Um, I want to take a, a breath and see what else is in the dream. And the, and there's something. Like it's in this space of I don't know what there is to discover together because we haven't talked about it much, but um, exploring what it like, just like the different ways that people are exploring ownership around creating the art they make and the words and the values that come into their companies and their cultures and 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 exploring that ownership process together. Um, and to me, the other the other thing that's really beautiful about art is that it's. Uh, it's universal. I think you might have mentioned this yesterday that it's a language that everybody in the world can understand and, and share. Uh, and one, a big part of our approach at Gen Equality is, is to really reinforce the belief that gender equality is everyone's cause. It's not about one gender over the other. Gender is obviously a spectrum. And uh, for us, it, getting everybody engaged in that is really important. And I love using the medium of art to, to bring in everyone's engagement. Um, so that element of it, that inclusion inherent in art to me is also really important and it's part of that dream of you know, reinforcing that belief too. Um, and then also 
you know, I don't know how many folks were in the, um, I think it was the Airbnb session yesterday asking about what are ways that we can um, not just block bias, but, you know, be better. Um, and to me, if people feel like our art is doing that, not just blocking bias, but actually inspiring a better way of being, that to me is a big part of the dream too. Can I have one little piece? Yeah. See, uh, it gets really fun, the dreams uh, part, I doesn't know. it? And then it's like inspiring and people are like, like this isn't just fun and it's not great here, but I want to take it home to people. I want to share this thing or, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Burstiness, there it is. So I know that you don't have your LLC written and all that yet, but at this point, does it feel like you are a hell yes to having deeper conversations, pursuing a partnership? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, all right. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate both of you coming up here and talking about some, I mean, vulnerable things. Oh yeah, don't forget your early warning detection flood system. <laughs> so that's it, it's short and sweet, it's four parts. It can be a super fast conversation or it can go on for a while. It is ongoing in our relationship and we have a question we would love to answer. I'll repeat the question. So the question is about sort of the, you said the sort of the manifestation energy, if I may, and you're talking about writing versus speaking, or? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can imagine having a conversation with the first person. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I, I fully I support it. that idea. I love it. I've already started a Google Doc with different ways you can use this conversation because people keep coming back with different ideas and they see different things inside of it. Um, somebody who runs a product team, by the way, said the product should have, or the customer should have a, you know, like someone should sit in the place of the customer while we talk, you know, while we go through it, which I think is fascinating. So there's lots of different ways to do it. And I will say one of the ways we really love um, to use it is actually when I'm trying to get clear about something by myself. Um, <laughs> I was actually just having an argument on Facebook with somebody, which is why I'm leaving Facebook. Um, but, uh, but one of the things I was like, well, wait a minute, what's my intention? Like, why am I, you know, like, why am I here? Why am I doing this thing? And I realized I didn't have a really great answer. And then when I got to the dreams bit, I realized that what I really, my dream was not that I vanquished my enemy, but that I, you know, which is where you get, right? It's where your brain goes, my, where my brain goes when I'm arguing on Facebook. Like, I want him in a pool of tears and crying. But really was for him to, for us to like reach common ground and to, and, and which was actually very threatening to me in a certain way. I was like, oh wait, no, I'm, I, you know, it really changed the way I interacted with it. And I love the idea of writing out dreams. I think absolutely seal it up in an envelope, really powerful, yeah. And I have been using this process by myself, writing it out in terms of product and program launches, in terms of, you know, personal mission for my business. So it's something that we've started using on our own in different ways as well. I'll even do it for five different things that I might spend time on, you know, and then, oh, this is the one that really wins, right? I'll help me prioritize. Yes, I, I have really, really fascinated about I'm really fascinated about your own internal, your own project, your own process. Um, because you mentioned how important it is to hear these things. I thought you said to hear it out, spoken out loud. So if you were doing it for yourself, would you then take your notes and speak to some trusted other aloud so you can hear them and hear it reflect, even if they didn't respond, just so that you hear your own voice? Uh, I think by default, we've been doing that as we as we do this process individually, because we both also work from home. It's like, hey, can I walk you through what I just talked with myself about? So it does end up, it does end up getting out there for sure. And I, I actually do see the value in that. Yeah, and another way I'll say, and this is a little bit of a segue, not quite an answer to your question, but, it, but a way that you can use this is you can actually use this without exposing to the other person what you're doing. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention, actually, is if we're talking about empathy, and actually if you were at Raj's uh, workshop earlier, she talked a lot about empathy. 
One of the interesting things about empathy is that it makes everything better, right? Like, no matter whether you like the other person or not, being able to take their perspective and sit in their shoes, and this was really brought home to me through a wonderful book called um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. I don't know if you all know it. Chris Voss was uh, the lead international hostage negotiator for the FBI. So, you know, like, oh, let's just split the difference. You kill two hostages and I'll give you half the money. You know, like, that doesn't quite work, right? He needed to get everybody out and not give up anything in return. And what he realized is he completely revolutionized the world of uh, negotiation. He went to the Harvard Negotiation Project and basically won every round there. And the reason he did was because just like a behavioral economist, he understood that emotions, that humans are not logical beings and that emotions are really central. What Voss says is that you have to develop something called tactical empathy, which I really love because it's like it, 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 it appeals to the middle-aged white man in me who wants to win. You know, like, oh, I'll just be tactically emp empathetic. I don't have to be weakly empathetic. Well, right? little side note, this dude is so empathic that it's actually a helpful little bit of a shield to, you know, put it all in one direction. Yeah, and it helps, you know, so what I'll also do is I'll use this in a sales context. So frequently without ever exposing the other person what I'm doing, I'll say, well, why do you want to do this project? Why, you know, what would, what, you know, what would, what would be the intents? Okay, so if we're gonna, if something's gonna go wrong, down the line, let's say it's a year from now and this project's gone horribly wrong. What, what happened? Why did it go wrong? Tell me about that. What are you worried about? What's your, what's your personal concern? What's in it for you? Um, you, know, what are your, you know, what are the boundaries? Like, who do I need to talk to in order to get this thing signed? Is it just you or is it five other people in your organization? Uh, and then, you know, so we can kind of walk through. And then, hey, if this was gonna be really great, let's say it's two years from now and this was amazing, what happened? What's true? And you get them into that, I think you get them into really, frankly, my ability to sell went through the roof when I started actually doing this because I'm developing very consciously tactical empathy for the person who's across on the other side of the table from me. So, unless we have more questions, Bob and I are gonna hang out. Oh, we have one more. Yeah, I see uh, this is a great framework for uh, generative dialogue, uh, a discovery. Uh, what's your experience been in using it in uh, uh, tough situations, uh, contrary, players, ideas, uh, conflict scenarios, has it played, how's it played out? It is at its use. Yeah. You mean before we go to visit the in-laws, <laughs> yeah. which we actually use it for that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we do use it in tough situations, but I think your discussion is like, is this like a negotiation framework when people are coming at it from maybe opposite sides and it feels like a zero-sum game potentially, like someone's gotta win and someone's gotta lose. I, I, don't, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but. Right, where there's dramatically different needs at stake. So I'll say this, that this is not necessarily a conflict resolution. I think of this as more of a conflict avoidance or a conflict exposing. Like, let's expose where we're going to con con have conflict, and we might need to use another framework later down the road. Um, but I will say I have used this in some, you know, in some, uh, that executive team I mentioned earlier, the one where the, 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 the leader sort of brought us all to tears. One of the things I noticed is everything didn't evaporate. The internal conflicts didn't go away but the team felt like just a little more on common ground. You know, it's the beginning of a process. Um, I'll also say that like we use this, this is kind of like the ongoing conversation in our relationship. Like we've, played, we've done the scales enough time that now we're just playing jazz all the time. Like, oh, you know, like we're gonna see in-laws and like, why do you, you know, what, do you, what about this one? You know, are you concerned about this particular trip? What are your concerns? Well, yeah. going back to the ritualization of it, because we've practiced it so many times, and again, my clients, our friends, the teams that he has been steeping in this, it becomes shorthand. So if you've had practice with it before the conflict, then it's a really easy way to deal with conflict in the moment. So I say use it before conflict and then it can be a tool during conflict, but we don't necessarily teach it that way. Cool. And with that, I want us to be conscious of time and I want to say a couple of things before we go. So this tool, this book, is really, we, we thought of for a long time about how to release it, and eventually we decided just to release it for free. So you can actually go to our website, you can download the, a PDF of it just by clicking a button without giving us anything because we just really want it out there. Um, certainly helps our career when it's out there for a lot of people, but really for us, this was just a tool we thought was really valuable, we wanted it out there. You can also buy it on Amazon, it's there for pre-sale right now. Um, we would love to have some pre-sale numbers 
uh, up uh, before it's Saturday. It's only 99 cents 99 cents. On we Kindle. kept the price as low as possible. Uh, and also on the website, too, you can get a bunch of other things that we think make it more useful. There's a, a demo video of us walking through it. There's a cheat sheet, a facilitator's guide, and a series of slides and stuff like that. So please share it. Um, also, if you haven't gotten a book, we wanted everybody here to at least have one free book. And if you want to take some back to your team, we're more than happy to sell you some of those as well. So we do, we do have a stack as well. So meet us in the back. We've got lots of books there. We'd love to say hi, talk about it, or reconnect later. Thank you all so much you. for your time. Thank you.